I want to come with a word of encouragement um, tonight, and as, as usual, I'm assuming everybody in the room is a believer, and I'm, I'm assuming that everybody's given their life to Jesus. Um, clearly, if you haven't, that's something we can do tonight. But for the sake of this word, I'm going to make an assumption that we're all born again believers in this room. I'm going to pose the question to you tonight over and over again, do you know him? Do you know him? Let me pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we don't have to ask and beg and scream for you to come, Lord, but you're already here. Father, you're always here. You're alive on the inside of us, Father. You're, you, we're, we're hidden in you, Father, and you're all around us. You go before us, Lord, and there's no place where we could be where you're not, Lord. That's right. Just help us become more aware of your presence, Lord. That's what we want. We want to be more aware of, Father, of those realities, Father, heaven realities. May everything that I speak tonight, Father, just be blessed. If there's something I've prepared to say that you don't want me to say, Lord, help me just skip over that and just flood this place with an awareness of your presence in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to ask you, do you truly know him? Do you know Jesus that we sing about? Do you know the one that we worship? And uh, what got me thinking about this was an interesting conversation I had with our school chaplain a couple of weeks ago. And um, the school chaplain where I work also doubles up from time to time as a marriage counsellor. And and she says time and time again, she's dealing with couples who have been married possibly for 20 years, who come to the end of their tether and they literally say they don't know the person that they're married to. And it's an interesting concept, isn't it? That you can be in a relationship for such a long time, but not know the person that you're in the relationship with. <laughs> Sounds odd. You might be able to relate to that. You might know some people. Um, you might have, we might have gone through some of those things in our own marriages or our own friendships and relationships. On the flip side to that, you can have friendships that are relatively young, can't you? Like you can meet someone and, and 12 months down the track, you feel like you've got a really intimate friendship with that person, yeah? Who can relate to that? I've had friendships like that as well. Some friendships that have been around for 15, 20 years, I feel like I hardly know the guy. Other friendships that have just popped up and three months into it, you feel like, wow, this is, this is really something special. I'd hate for us as believers to journey, you know, through life week after week and being a Christian for 20 or 30 years or 40 years and not truly know Jesus. Amen. And it's a lifelong discovery. It's not a, it's not a quick fix. There's always, you know, there's always deeper. There's always more revelations. But do you know him? Do you know that you know him? The one that you're singing about, the one that you're worshipping, do you truly know him? I was thinking about the difference between believers under the old covenant in the Old Testament compared to you and I, these new covenant, new creation, you know, believers in the New Testament. Yeah, we can, we can genuinely relate to Jesus. The Old Testament, we get these little, these little highlights, don't we, where it might be a, might be a Moses who you know, seems to, to love to linger in the tent of meeting, doesn't he? Spending time in the presence of the Lord. Or, or you might get a little snapshot of David who dances joyfully be- before the Lord and we think, wow, these guys have got really intimate, special relationships with God. But that was the one-off. That wasn't the, the general consensus for, for, you know, for all of the Jews, for all of the believers, for all of the Israelites. That was the odd story here and there. The difference is for you and me, every single one of us is called to have intimacy with the Father, yeah? Every single one of us is called to know Jesus on a deep, deep personal level. Amen? Amen. That's my goal tonight. Is My heart tonight is to reveal Jesus. might just be an extra little layer. We might just peel that layer of the onion back just, just one more time. But hopefully, we can go deeper into knowing him. I'm going to give you, in about five minutes' time, I'm going to be reading from the book of Hosea. 
Thought I'd give you a bit of warning. Probably haven't read from the book of Hosea for a while. It might take you 15 minutes to find it. So I'll give you a little bit of a heads up. The book of Hosea is coming up. All right. Thinking about this, this concept, believers in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, they were told to love the Lord, weren't they? It was a commandment. Obviously, Moses received that, you know, when he, went to, when he climbed Mount Sinai. It's recorded again in Deuteronomy when there's that commandment, the children of Israel, the Lord, it says, love the Lord our God, He is our Lord, and you shall love the Lord. They were commanded. It was this external voice that says you will love the Lord. And unless you've got a personal, intimate relationship with someone, it's probably hard to just say yes to that, isn't it? They might have heard the stories of how they were delivered out of Egypt, and they might have heard this story and that story. But unless something becomes personal... I reckon that would be a hard commandment to follow. Who can sort of see that? I, I'm sort of thinking about, about a foster kid who's perhaps bouncing around from home to home. <clears throat> They've been perhaps a little bit neglected and, you know, the social worker puts them in a, new, in, a new, in a new family. The social worker says to the foster child, this is your mum and dad. You will love them. Who knows for that foster kid, that's not going to be super easy from day one, is it? From day one, that's probably going to be a little bit of a challenge. But over time, as trust is built, as a relationship's formed, it perhaps becomes possible. Jeremiah gives us a little snapshot, the prophet Jeremiah, as to how this whole thing's going to change and how it's going to change from being this external commandment. No longer is it going to be, love the Lord your God, but it's going to be something that comes from the inside of a believer. So Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, I'll read it to you because I know you've probably got your fingers in Hosea or you, some of you might be still trying to find it. Jeremiah 31, 34 reads, No longer will they each teach their neighbour or will they say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, I'll forgive their wickedness and I'll remember their sins no more. Amen. Can you see the difference? Instead of this external commandment where, where someone's being told, you must love the Lord, Jeremiah's prophesying of a time, a time that is now, where each person will have an intimate knowledge of who the Father is and in response to that, will love the Lord, yeah? Can you see the difference? Yes. One's an external commandment. One starts from the inside and works its way out. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? Or are we stuck on the religious treadmill that's sometimes called church? Where we go to church, we go to the prayer meetings, we think we're doing everything right, but do we know Jesus? <clears throat> Our family and I, um, at the moment, are, are going through an interesting season. So we thought, just for something different, we've never done this before, um, but every Wednesday night, we do a little family Bible study. And I'd highly recommend it. If you've got family or if you've got friends, just, just gathering people and doing a very casual, low-key Bible study is great fun. So Cass and I and the two older boys, Jacob and Max, Normally around 7.30 on a Wednesday after we've put the two little ones to bed, we just gather around and we've started going through the book of Mark. And uh, the four of us are there with four Bibles, all different translations, so we can sort of discuss things. The book of Mark is fascinating. If you feel like you're under the pump and you haven't got much time to read the Bible, jump into the book of Mark. It sort of crams it, what, what the other authors sort of put into about 20... 20 to 30 chapters, Mark crams that into 16 chapters. And it's just highlights after highlights after highlights. And from chapter 1, it's all about Jesus, yeah? In chapter 1, Jesus is casting out demons on the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus is eating with sinners in the house of Levi. In Mark chapter 3, again, 
Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is sleeping through the storms. Every chapter, you see a picture of Jesus that you might not necessarily expect. That religion doesn't always portray. Do we know Jesus? We love him because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. I think we'd all agree that God is love. We would all agree with that. And I love how <clears throat> God defines what love is in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 8. He says, He demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Before you knew him, before you'd said yes, before you responded, before you drew near to him, he showed his love for you and died for you. Amen. A scripture you've probably never read before. You've probably never heard of this scripture before, but it's in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. <laughs> Who's never heard of that? <clears throat> and I was, just came across it recently, but it only needed the first little portion of it where it says, For God so loved the world. You know, the church doesn't always represent Jesus in a way where God so loved the world, does it? If you ask the average believer, oh, sorry, the average non-believer, and you said to them, what do you think God's perspective is of the world? What do you think most non-believers would think? <coughs> Condemnation, judgment, shame, guilt. They'd be all of those. I think if we surveyed the world, that would be the response we get. But this scripture says he didn't just love the world. He so loved the world. Amen. He so loved the world. When you so love something, you, you, do some, you can do some crazy stuff. I don't know about you, but I remember when we had, um, when our first son, Jacob, when he started, he started primary school, and I can remember him as a reception kid and the very first sports day we went to. Who knows primary school sports days can get pretty messy from a parent's perspective? And you get some crazy parents there who are over, you know, living their dreams through their kids, cheering from the sidelines. But I think part of that is because you so love your kids, don't you? And I can remember Jacob's first ever 100 metre sprint. And in hindsight, probably wasn't our best moment. I was at the finish line because I so love my boy. I so love him. Cass was on the sideline. The starter's gun goes off. Cass is running next to him. <laughs> Come on, Jacob. You can do it. I'm standing at the finishing line. Come on, Jacob. You can do it. The poor kid's five years old and he's got two grown adults yelling at him to run faster. But when you so love something, you can do some silly things, can't you? We're going to read, we're going to read about some radical, outrageous, silly things in the name of love in the book of Hosea. Have we found the book of Hosea? Yeah. Are we there? Yeah. Page 1724, I believe. <laughs> We're going to read in a second from chapter 3. Who's never read the book of Hosea before? Awesome. Who hasn't read it for ages? Wow, so who's read it recently? Must be. Oh, hello. <laughs> Actually? <Yeah>. Darn it. <laughs> Oh, wow, awesome. I'm going to paint the picture for you. So Hosea was a prophet. He would speak the word of the Lord. So he would have been a respectable guy in Israel. He would have been a well-known guy. Uh, I'm picturing that he would have walked down the street and many people would have known who Hosea was. And this prophet, who existed about 750 years before Christ gets a word from the Lord. And he gets this word from the Lord where, it's, where the Lord speaks to him and says, Hosea, it's time for you to find a wife. It's time to get married. How exciting is that? As a young man, you know, young prophet, he would be like, thank you, God. It's time to get a wife. All right, how are we going to do this? And then the Lord speaks to him and he says, 
you were going to go and marry a prostitute, an adulterous woman. Can you imagine? A respectable guy, a guy well known to the nation. And the Lord says to him, Hosea, you are going to go and marry a prostitute. This is in chapter 1. And Hosea, being a faithful guy, says, all right, let's do this. He goes and find, finds himself a wife. Her name's Goma, and they get married. And things are going pretty good. Things are going okay for a couple of years. They have, have a son first up, I think. In total, they have three children. So over a course of about three or four years, Hosea is probably thinking, this is not too bad. This is actually working out pretty well. But then all of a sudden, Goma ups and leaves him. All of a sudden, Hosea wakes up one morning, checks the ensuite, she's not there, checks the living room, she's normally watching sunrise on her 90-inch LED TV, she's not there, checks out the back, checks the shed, checks everywhere, and it turns out Goma, the prostitute that he'd married, had gone back to her old way of life. Can you imagine, all of a sudden, this respectable guy, this man of God who thought he was doing, you know, the will of the Father was a single dad with three kids. We're going to pick it up in chapter 3. Interestingly, we don't exactly know the time frame between when Goma left um, Hosea and then when this word from the Lord comes to him. Hos Did I say Hosea? Hosea? Yeah. Hosea? Am I saying that right? <laughs> Right. Let's pick it up in chapter 3. All right. Then the Lord said to me, go show, your, go show love to your wife again. Can you imagine? Who thinks that's not what he would have been expecting? He would have been thinking, all right, the Lord's going to release me from this, this covenant that I made with this woman. She's done the wrong thing. It's time for me to move on. The next time... God speaks to me, he'll be saying, all right, it's time to get wife number two. It's not the way he's worked. Go and show your love to your wife again. Although she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Can you imagine? Do we really know him? I hope you can see what this story's pointing to. Let's continue reading in verse 2. Can you imagine Hosea actually seeking out his prostitute wife? Can you imagine what that would have looked like? You know, Hosea, a respectable guy, would have had to go to the, you know, I guess the red light district or the, the Hindley Street equivalent and would have had to start asking around, wouldn't he? He would have been asking people that probably recognised him, have you seen my wife? Have you seen Goma? And he would have been digging and searching and, and trying to track down this wife that's left him and gone back to become a prostitute again. In verse 2, he obviously finally found, finds her and he says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. I looked that up, that's about nearly 200 kilos of barley. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days, and you will not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I'll behave the same way towards you. Who can just feel the grace just on that scripture? Who can just feel like, the forgiveness, the tenderness, and the heart of the Father all over that, yeah? So this woman's done an absolute atrocity to her husband, and the Lord says, no, 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 you're going to take her back in. Interestingly, the silver represents, you know, value, doesn't it? The barley represents provision. So effectively, what Hosea is saying to Goma is he saying, I value you, I want to provide for you, and I'm going to make a covenant to never leave you again. Amen? Who does that sound like? 
I hope we're seeing in this, in this parable that every single one of us are the Gomers. Amen? Every single one of us here is Gomer. We are the prostitute. But Jesus is the Hosea. Amen? Jesus is the Hosea. Jesus is the one who says to us, I'm going to purchase you back. What I found fascinating, Hosea had to buy something back he already owned. He had to purchase back that which was already his. Interesting to think about, isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that exactly the same with us? God creates us in, in his own image. We are first and foremost gods. Through the fall of man, we drift away from that. And then Jesus purchases back what was already God's. Amen? Yeah. Is that good news? Yeah. And what I love about this story is we see the heart of the Father all over it. We see the heart of the Father moving and saying, Hey, regardless of what you've done, I want to renew my covenant with you tonight. Yeah? I want to provide for you. I value you and you are mine. And I love the wording here that we have. He says, then I told her, you are to live with me many days. In other words, we're going to be together for a long time. Can you just imagine Goma's reaction to that? There's, there's only one way to respond to overwhelming grace, isn't there? And that is just, to, you say yes to grace. You, you can't say no to grace. And so when Hosea comes in and says, you are going to spend time with me, doesn't come in, come in with guilt and condemnation. Doesn't kick the door open and say, what the heck's going on in here? What are you doing? How dare you? He says, no, no, I'll purchase you back and you are going to live with me for many days. You're not going to be with any other men. I'm not going to be with any other women. We are making a new covenant. We're going to reconnect. We're going to get this thing happening again. Amen. Two things I, I take from this story, um, as I sort of haven't got too much, only another five minutes and we're, and we're there. Two things I get. You and me are the gomers. Just turn to your neighbour and say, you are the gomer of this story. You're the gomer. <clears throat> turn to your neighbour and say, Jesus is the Hosea. Friends, do you know him? Do you know him? This is the Jesus we worship. You might think you've done some horrible things and that there's, there's no possible way back to the Father. You might have think you've, just, you've strayed way too far to the left and there's no possible way you can come back into fellowship with God. But Jesus is pursuing you. Amen. Jesus continues to pursue you. He continues to value you, to want to provide for you, and he wants to make a covenant with you that says, I'm going to never leave you. Amen. Amen. The flip side to that is that there's, there's a world out there, that there's a world out there of Gomers, isn't there? There's a world out there that does not know the love of the Father. We get to be the Hosea to the world, don't we? We get to represent, we get to represent the heart of the Father in a way that is lavish in grace, lavish in love, and demands a yes response. You don't, people don't say no to grace. When they feel what the heart of the Father is towards them, when they, when they know that there's someone who values them, regardless of what they've done, when they know that there's someone who wants to provide for them and has a better way, the response will always be yes. If you're here this morning, I... Ray put me on the spot. Appreciate that, Ray. Thank you very much. And I gave a brief <laughs> testimony about how before I came to the Lord, um, you know, I was messed up with all sorts of things. And, you know, I, was, I you know, drank too much and was involved in other, other sorts of drugs as well. Really unhealthy lifestyle. And when the Lord came to me in the most unlikely way in a nightclub called church, there was no condemnation. There was no guilt. He, he just spoke to my heart and said, I have a better way for you than this. How good is that? 
You can't say no to that. When, when the gospel comes, you know, surrounded with forgiveness, surrounded with grace and the heart of the Father, people don't say no. People want that. That automatically draws people in. Amen. Do we really know him? I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. I pray that tonight, Jesus, we would just feel as if we know you a little bit more. That we would just know you a tiny, tiny little bit more. That we would see you as Hosea, the one who will pursue us again and again and again. Regardless of how far we've strayed, Lord, that your heart, Lord, is to bring us back in. That you want to provide for us. You value us. You've purchased us, Father, and you want to be with us forever, Lord. I pray for every single person here, Lord. I pray that there'd be no condemnation. Lord, I pray that they would run into your open arms, Father, right now. May their hearts and minds be transformed, Father. May they not see you as an angry God, looking to measure performance, Father, but may they, may they see you as a God who accepts them, Father, and has, laid, has sent their son to die for them, Lord. We just thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in this community. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ray.